So my name is Jared McCormick. I'm the acting director and the director of graduate studies here at the Kevorkian Center. And I wanted to welcome everybody to uh, the third event in the digital forays for the spring. This is Space and Place Part One, Critical Mapping and Counter Cartography. And in two weeks, we have the continuation of this, the part two, which is visualization and digital storytelling. Um, so uh, everybody has uh, hopefully seen the description of the panel um, online, but really, uh, you know, we're going to be dealing with a lot of issues of mapping of GPS, but also this kind of like critical subversive pushback, not just in uh, your academic work, but also perhaps um, artistic and from an, an activist perspective. Um, somebody from, from the Kevorkian Center will be sharing in the chat um, some of the other upcoming events. On Tuesday, we have uh, the final event in the Global Uprising series. Um, and then there are still two more events in digital forays. So the links for those will, will be sent. Um, I, I'm trying to keep my the, everything brief just uh, as we all become exhausted on Zoom and it's springtime. Um, so really quickly, just to run through the format, um, we have three speakers who each will be offering an entry point um, in 10 minutes. After that, we'll pivot to the discussant and there will be 30 minutes of all four of them really kind of opening up, um, engaging, asking one another questions. And then the final 30 minutes goes to the audience for questions. I just wanna encourage everyone that anytime you want to kind of flag something, recommend a book, pose a question or a thought, feel free to do so in the chat. When we get to that final portion, you'll also be allowed to kind of, if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. The meeting is, uh, this event is being recorded. It will be on the Kevorkian Center's uh, YouTube channel within a week, um, but we'll stop the, the video for the Q&A so people can um, ask their questions freely. So um, I'm going to, rather than give everyone um, the illustrious and deserved introductions that they deserve, um, I, I, we're going to paste in their bios in, in the chat so that everybody can see it. Um, but we have Majd al-Shahabi, Nermeen al-Sharif, Ghazal Jafari, and Timur Hamad as the, the discussant. Um, and all, everything about them, you guys have hopefully already seen, but you'll see in the chat. So uh, without further ado, I will um, stop there and turn it over to you, Majd. Unmute myself. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jared, for having us. And uh, so I'm really excited about this, this talk because actually I've been uh, like I've been chewing on a lot of ideas recently uh, related to this topic. And I didn't want to give the usual Palestine open maps talk. So I'm excited about sharing like some more raw ideas. But I think this is a like a nice context uh, for them. Uh, I wanted to, uh, here, I'll share my screen first. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a bit of a complicated title. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in a bit. Uh, the main project that I, that kind of started this kind of thinking, the line of thinking of, uh, uh, that I uh, uh, I want to present today is Palestine Open Maps. So Palestine Open Maps is a project where I've I with uh, uh, with so my colleague Ahmed Barkley he found a set of maps. Uh, we collected them together. I'll show you a demo of how we collected them. But first, I want to talk about the map origins. So this photo was taken by uh, Salman Abu Sitta. Salman Abu Sitta is like the godfather of Palestinian maps. He's been collecting Palestine maps since like 62. Uh, and uh, this is a photo from uh, 
from the Palestine Exploration Fund archive. The Palestine Exploration Fund is an, an entity that still exists until today. They're based in Greenwich. And they did the first survey of Palestine, survey map of Palestine in the, in the 1870s, 80s. And, uh, and this is a, a notebook by Naman Qasatli, um, uh, uh, who is described in the archive as the Damascene scribe. And, uh, but if you look through his, his writing and his notebooks, uh, you see that he's actually doing a lot more than scribing. He's doing a lot more, uh, 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 like a lot more of the surveying work. And here in this particular page, you see his, his transliteration of uh, Arabic place names into English place names. The, the maps that I'm talking about, they exist in a lot of different archives. One of them is a British library. This is a set, like I, I, when I visited the British library a couple of years ago, this is the set that I was able to get access to. Uh, but the one set that I did, that, I, that we did use for Palestine Open Maps that was found by my uh, colleague Ahmed Barkley is, ex exists in the National Library of Israel. Um, and it's a set of uh, more like uh, there's a different uh, four different sets of maps that we're looking at. The most detailed one is one to twenty thousand scale, made by the Palestine, uh, so not by the Palestine Exploration Fund, by the but by the Survey of Palestine. So what Ahmed did, which is like which uh, like on the websites uh, of the of the library, you can't just right click and download the high resolution map. You have uh, he wrote a script that kind of scraped the entire, all of the tiles of the map, stitched them together and made this giant map. Uh, and this is, and then what we did is that we took all of the individual map sheets, 155 of them, and we cut out the frame, stitched them together and made this one massive map uh, that covers Palestine from the, the all the way north to the Naqab Desert boundaries. So I just wanna give you a very quick demo of how it works, just to kind of demonstrate the, the, the the texture of the platform. Uh, this is what it's when you land on the on the platform. This is what it looks like. This is uh, we launched it in uh, in on uh, like when land day was happening, like the land day protests, the day of return protests were happening in Gaza in eight, uh, in 2018. So we focused it there. Um, and if uh, if you zoom out, you see all of these dots. Each one of the dots represents a Palestinian locality. Um, the green ones are the ones that exist today, and the red, uh, orange, and the yellow ones are the ones that were ethnically cleansed or depopulated during the Nakba or the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948, which is also the the, the creation of Israel. Uh, I want to zoom. I tur I'll turn off this layer um of the dots and you can see here like each one of the maps map sheets is a square that has its own discoloration and so on i want to zoom into my grandparents village which is halfway between nazareth which is right here and the tiberius which is right here uh and so this is lubia uh, and in the map you can see some really interesting things that the the, the surveyors uh, of the british army uh uh, created. So you see, like, first of all, you see the, 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 um, the built area. So the reddish brown here, uh, the green is orchard, O is orchard, OL is olives, V is vineyard. But really importantly, you see like things like where's the school, where's the maqam, like the shrines, um, two, there are two shrines in Lubia. Uh, the original place names, so Warat Sheikh Muhammad al-Turi, Zaytunat Abu Aun, etc. And if you if you go back in time a few years before, and this is this is possible because we are using like uh, uh, like just modern mapping technology, and we are layered all of the maps on top of each other precisely. Um, this is um, the map of the Palestine Exploration Fund, which you where you see Lubia uh, from the 1870s. Uh, two years before the Nakba, this map was was published, and it's it's less less detailed, but you see the main road that connects Nazareth to Tiberias. Um, and uh, Lubia is, the, is halfway between, and you see all of these minor roads that lead up to Lubia. And immediately after the Nakba, this map was, was published, and it shows uh, 
an inscription in Hebrew just under the toponym Lubia. And in Hebrew, it says Horos, uh, which literally means destroyed in the passive voice, right? Because uh, we don't know who destroyed it. Uh, sarcasm. Uh, if we go to uh, uh, if we go to back to the map, this is Lubia. This is immediately before the Nakba. Three years after the Nakba, the exact same map was published, just with one major difference, which is literally Lubia is wiped off the map. Right, the roads that lead up to it are still there, um, but the map, the the village itself is is literally removed. Um, so if I go back to, to the most detailed map, this is what you see. And if I switch to the satellite image of today, um, this is where the red, the red houses used to be. Uh, and what's around it, this is the ironically called the South African Memorial Forest. And this is a Jewish only settlement. So the orchards of what there was are no longer there. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, and what's planted there is a is a pine, a European pine forest. So I want to go back to, so this is kind of like an overview of what Palestine maps, open maps does. And I want to go back to the presentation to just show you kind of like some of the, the counter cryptographic uh, gestures that we do through this project. Uh, one of the things that uh, I pointed out is that we, the original maps are just individual map sheets. Uh, and they have, uh, each map sheet has its frame, as you can see, and the legend underneath, which is highlighted here. Uh, and the legend, what we've done is that we've, uh, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, 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 Max Werde, he, he went through and converted the legend into, uh, into uh, uh, basically the modern equivalence in OpenStreetMap. So the triangulation points uh, becomes a survey point, uh, a cave becomes a cave entrance in uh, an open street map, et cetera. And we took this kind of translation, ontological translation from Palestine, from the original maps that were made by the British colonial authorities for British colonial purposes. And we kind of turned them into, uh, we, can, we turned the key into uh, uh, into what is used right now by OpenStreetMap. And what I, I then did is that I set up OpenStreetMap. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but it's basically the Wikipedia of maps. Anyone can go in and edit it. And I just took the infrastructure of, of OpenStreetMap and I set it up on my own server. And I got people to, I ran these mapathons where I get people to run, uh, to go through the maps and vectorize or extract the data out of the maps. And uh, I've run 22 of them. The last one just was just like a couple of weeks before the shutdown in Dubai, before the lockdown and the pandemic started. Um, and uh, and I've, but I've also run them in like Palestinian refugee camps and the Dawi and Burj Shmali in Lebanon. And uh, I'll go, in, maybe I'll go into this slide later because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but one of the things that are really interesting that comes out of, uh, out of the vectorization is that you have this really interesting set of data that is very detailed, that has, uh, uh, that covers most of Palestine from the north to the south, and it's vectorized. So it's, it's machine readable. The computer can read it very easily, and then you can do things with it. Uh, so here is like the map that I just showed you of Lubia, and this is the satellite image. And once it's vectorized, this is what it looks like. So here you see like different polygons and each polygon is has latitude and longitude at every node in the, in the, in the polygon. And, uh, and, and each point can be linked to, to external data sources. So here I've linked it to Palestine Remembered, to Wikidata, to uh, I've given it, I've reversed the transliteration of the, of the English place name. So instead of Lubia in English, I, I, I wrote the, the Arabic name, uh, et cetera. But one of the things that kind of happens is that uh, you can then take this data and like overlay it on other types of data. So here's, uh, so what, what you get is something like this. So here's the historical data of Palestine open maps. The, this is the historical village. And I, I like to me, it looks like it's it's the ghost of Lubia hovering over uh, the modern day 
uh, uh, South African memorial forests. So uh, this is like what this ha what happens through this gesture of like translating the ontology of the colonial map into a modern uh, ontology related to Palestinian to to the, of the open street map community is is a, is an interesting gesture and I think what it presents is that th there is a lot of difficulties in translating because there is a lot of nuance that is lost. And uh, I want to kind of like come at the same question from a different angle, which is uh, a kind of like a mini scandal that kind of emerged over the past couple of years. For So these are uh, the first screenshot to the left is a news article from the national, from Al-Akhbar newspaper in Lebanon. Um, and this is kind of like, it kind of created a, a lot of buzz in 2019 where the National Geographic, which has a branch in, uh, in, the, the, in Abu Dhabi, they uh, published a feature uh, that uh, specifically talks about uh, the Judean deserts uh, and the types of animals that live there, etc. And in Arabic, they call it the Judean desert, Sahra Yahuda. Um, and then, so the uproar that kind of came, came against it is that why are you using the Israeli term, the commonly agreed on Israeli term for the for the desert, uh, and why are you not using the uh, the Arabic name for the for the region, which is Barari al Khalil or the the the, the wilderness wilderness of Hebron? Um, uh, uh, and then, like, if you if you pause there and you look at what another. Uh, open data repository, the biggest open data repository probably in the, in the world, which is Wikipedia, what it, what it has is actually, it has, a, it has an article for the Judean desert, but it, and what it does not have is an article for uh, Barari al-Khalil. Uh, and, and if you look at where the article originates, it's, it probably originates from the English article in the, that was created in the first place. So the, and the Arabic article is actually a translation of the English article. And this is, uh, and like what this highlights to me, I think, is that there is some kind of, uh, there's a problem in the translation that, uh, that's kind of, that we're forced into, into uh, considering. And, uh, and, and our understanding of, of space is no longer attached to the local knowledge of the people who live in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in the region and have its own their own name for it and like notice even if we were to agree that uh, Palestine is only limited to the West Bank, most of the Judean so-called Judean desert or the Beriet al Khalil is actually uh, is in the West Bank. Um, so. Uh, so why are we? Why is the Wikipedia article, which is supposed to reflect the society, uh, the Wikipedia, the wikis, the Arabic Wikipedia, is supposed to reflect the society that it's, it represents? Uh, why is it using the Israeli term as opposed to the Palestinian indigenous term? And uh, this is also similar to and an, a similar. Uh, uh, kind of conflict happened with the article of Sarah Hagazi. Sarah Hagazi was a Pal not a Palestinian, an Egyptian uh, communist and uh, and LGBT rights activist who was arrested in Mashrua Layla in a in a in a concert in Egypt for raising the rainbow flag. She was tortured and eventually she became a refugee in Canada and she killed herself um, in June uh, of last year. Uh, Immediate, that caused a huge uproar and like it, it impacted uh, the entire uh, uh, queer community in around the Arabic speaking world and around the world. And in response, there was a ton of articles uh, uh, on, uh, on different language Wikipedias. I think the last I counted, there were 15 different language Wikipedia articles uh, that, start, that were started immediately within hours of her death. Uh, and what happened, including Arabic, and but what happened is that the Arabic language Wikipedia article was immediately deleted, um, and it was. And if you go to the Arabic 
article, it's a, a subsection. Uh, it's not even its own section. It's a subsection within the article on LGBT rights in Egypt. Uh, so there's a question here that's represented in, okay, so we have these open data repositories and all of them are, and they're stuck in the translation process between the European or the English actually mostly uh, articles into the Arabic articles. And very, very quickly, I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, this is the, a list of new entries, new articles on Arabic Wikipedia, and you see the number fluctuates. The spikes are basically, uh, are usually like uh, big campaigns that are run by the Wikipedia community. Um, and, but what you also see here is uh, the number of translated articles that's slowly climbing uh, from English to Arabic. Uh, and that's the, the blue line here and it's steadily climbing, as opposed to this kind of like flat line number of new articles in uh, 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 per month over the same period of time. Uh, so what this is indicating to me is that there is a lot more knowledge created through the translation of, Ara of from English into Arabic, as opposed to knowledge that's created in Arabic for Arabic speakers. Uh, and this is just a quick comparison between the two uh, timelines. I'll stop here because uh, I think I've run out of time uh, and we'll read the rest for uh, the discussion afterwards. Much, thank you so much. Um, we will pivot to Nanine. Hi, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, much. This was uh, actually the first time I hear you. I heard you a lot speaking about the uh, Open um, Maps Palestine, but uh, it's the first time I hear it being presented. And now I realize why over our uh, friendship <laughs> we had a lot in common beyond um, our personal um, relationships. So uh, I also had um, um, a history with the old uh, colonial maps that led me to a series of projects that I've never thought of them as one big project. But now looking back, I'm thinking that there's something in common. And I would like to take this opportunity of us talking today to think of them. Also, because I've always had this uh, divide between analog and digital. So I did uh, or interest between seeing what the digital can offer. And I think that's what uh, in many ways so far digital forays have been highlighting. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, how the digital is perceived and used in the in the region of the Arab Middle East. So I started with the, my my master's project uh, uh, in the School of Architecture, and I was basically studying the maps of seventeen made in seventeen ninety eight by the French expedition uh, in Egypt, which is the first modern objective maps of uh, Egypt, the first maps to be made on a Mercator grid, the first maps to show the multi-scale different extents. Prior to that, we had, that, of course, a lot of maps, but they were ma mainly uh, sailors' maps. The history and the urban history of cities like Cairo was um, documented, but rather through literary forms like Khutut al-Jabarti or and Makrizi, which are very textual, very detailed descriptions of the cities, of neighborhoods, of relationships, of even buildings and building styles, but not in a cartographic sense. So my master's basically looked at how the maps of uh, the modern maps of Egypt done by Napoleon and his savants um, went hand in hand with the making of the modern state and how they were after the, so the French expedition only lasted for three years in Egypt from 1798. And the maps were later published in 1801 to 1809 in France. But these maps were later adopted by um, the following regime, which is the rise of Muhammad Ali's kingdom in Egypt to um, reshape a city like Cairo and to administrate it. So my whole work was basically trying to see how these um, means of government governance were made possible through cartography and how signs and, and, and how a colonial map in the first place that mainly highlighted resources, military enforcements and um, military projects to build forts and uh, connections and to invade even to the east and to the south of Egypt uh, in the future was used to build the later so-called modern state. And uh, meanwhile, I'll share quickly my screen. I don't have um, like a presentation, but it's rather 
um, a way of showing how I came to that. So meanwhile, I was so much fascinated, like many of back then in Egypt with um, open street maps. And what captured always my attention, for example, this is Cairo and this is a screenshot like taken uh, one month ago. And that was actually what captured my attention back then. Someone removed Al Hazb Al Watani Demokrati, which is the National Democratic Party, and renamed it Al Huzn Al Watani Demokrati. And that's not only the case in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Actually, the building now has been demolished three or four years ago, I guess. Uh, but it still remains on Wikimapia. So who keeps it and who doesn't mind it remaining? And that to me was the question of the digital or me maybe being under the, uh, um, the force of uh, researching and looking at very colonial maps, very objective and pretending to be serious maps and looking to the world of internet where other people can use uh, na name, different naming techniques to speak of the Hosn Watani Demokrati or in other even outskirts in Cairo, people start cursing each other. So you find like, um, uh, this is the house of XYZ who is like non-appropriate non um, name calling or something. Uh, and at that time, I was also very lucky to be part of the multiple uh, alternative learning or exper experimenting with knowledge production initiatives happening in Egypt. And I was part of the history workshops, which is Ahkiya Tariq, done by the historian Alia Musallam. And she was very open about trying to experiment with maps. Basically, the project was all about um, um, gathering oral, um, it's a work, oral history workshop, and the attempt was to try to visualize or to come up with visual production of these um, of these um, um, projects. And to me, it was a very good chance to think together with a group of people, how can we translate the affordances that we have of the digital, which is, as Majd has shown, you can turn on and turn off layers. You can zoom in and you can zoom out. You can play with time. You can play with different aspects into like common knowledge, understanding, and conceptions of map, maps. So for example, I'll quickly hover over these. So for example, the workshop that was done in Port Said was about the history of making of the city. The Port Said is the city on, I think everyone knows now where it is. <laughs> I think everyone in this place knows. Okay, so what we were trying to do was to visualize the history of the make of the establishment of Port Said as a city, and uh, how it was dealt with um, uh, in the interwar period, and how it was how it it uh, lived during the um, uh, tripartite aggression, and then how it was functioned after Sadat's neoliberal policies. So we had a timeline in which we wanted to visualize different epochs of the city, but we also wanted to play with the multi-scalar thing. So we had, um, and we, we aimed at, we thought of a counter map as a map that would challenge the assumptions of a map. So we wanted to challenge the legend. We wanted to challenge the scale. We wanted to challenge the extents. And we wanted to see what would it be if we can free the map from these ontologies of um, modern colonialist uh, thinking. So the map basically, this, uh, the, the legend itself showed personal narratives, showed the flow of people and goods and the flow of uh, particular pieces of music. And we tried to play with that in the sense that we had the map of the world telling the stories of people who came from different parts of the world and then who, who became part of different areas in Egypt and then moved to Port Said. And our attempt was to, uh, we already placed that map in uh, a cultural center in, uh, in Port Said. Um, and it was basically the very first few days, the work of the group of participants in the workshop. And later on, the map was open for public and for people from the neighborhoods to come and contribute with their own also uh, pieces of um, uh, personal archives. So we had uh, people who, uh, families of uh, civil resistance, for example, coming. And, um, and adding the works. The map was at the very end here, you can see it was very hard to navigate. And here was a moment of me seeing the difference between this analog and the digital. So it's not, it wasn't as easy as turning off a layer. It was very hard to turn off a layer, but it was very um, uh, exper experienced by people being able to pick a thread of how, for example, a particular uh, song has traveled over time from the South to the North of Egypt, or how did the family of uh, a particular photog photographer uh, donate his photographs from Sweden and found the way uh, of Port Said and to find the way back in Port Said. Um, so we did also later on another attempt to 
invade the analog space with the digital logic, if I can say, if I can make this very big assumption. Uh, and it was basically in Bursaida, what the type of material that we had were basically about uh, Alexandria, sorry, in the early 1920s and the upsurge of uh, coffee houses, theaters, and um, a printing press. And we had, we wanted to make a map that can speak of the city, the lived city at a particular moment of time and the imagined characters that came out of it. So we had the characters that came out of Jakub Sanwa's uh, literature. And what we wanted to do is to be able with our bodies to experience the space between the two layers of the map. Um, and we also played with threads. So we had on one side the map of the city itself and the other side the characters like Abu Nadar Zara and the uh, fictional um, characters that appeared through the literary um, uh, spaces. Uh, and here is Majd <laughs> back in the days. Uh, by doing these maps, we thought a lot together of how, what does it mean to be between uh, to connect an imagined space to a real space. And what does it mean to experience a map in a way that is a, a, digit, a map that adopts um, a multi-layered logic in an analog space? Both maps were not a massive success story by any means. Both maps were very hard to read, very hard to navigate, but so was the realities that we tried to correspond or to translate through them. Uh, my last attempt to deal with maps and mapping was back again in the academy so uh, i had finished or like almost been done with my dissertation back then and with a lot of frustration with the how strong and um uh the book i don't know how to pronounce this word in english so i will leave it but it's everywhere the map uh, the the official maps are there and their presence and their um uh, impact over our daily lives and how they're used to erase neighborhoods and built others as Majd has shown. So what I was trying to do was to experiment of how do we think of alternative maps through the university. And because I was teaching in the German University of Cairo in the School of Architecture with students who were relatively tech savvy and they had very uh, good technical skills, everyone wanted to make an app and everyone wanted to sell the app perhaps later to an entrepreneur. So these were all moments of me realizing that neither the digital would be a counter map nor the analog would be, but it's rather much of the logic of how do we think and make maps. Um, so the project started with us trying to experience the city of Cairo in different ways and trying to find ways in which we can play between the medium of the map and other uh, and, the, and the experienced city itself. So the outcomes were different. Some students went all the way towards entrepreneurial projects of trying to um, offer um, marketing solutions for small businesses in Cairo, while others tried to use the map as a, an interface of gaming and play. So they started to use um, maps themselves as ways of, there was an early, and this was before Pokemon Go, so there was an early attempt to make a Pokemon Go back at the day, <laughs> the day of experiencing, this, experiencing the city through the interface of the maps. However, what I would like to conclude with here was that, um, thinking about or throwing on the table the discussion around how do maps and uh, how do the analog and the digital have this presumed uh, qualities of emancipation or or not uh, especially that this is a discussion that's already happening and we are already seeing how the digital can be also become site of not only monetizing data and activities but also surveillance and erasure as Majd has uh, spoken even in the um, platforms that um, present itself as the most democratic, like Wikimapia or uh, Wikipedia. So I hope I'm on time and I would leave it now to Razul, looking forward. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll just pivot here to Razul. Thank you, Narmin. Okay, let me share my screen with you. I move you here. There you go, now we're good. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jared, uh, and other colleagues for inviting me here. My name is Ghazal Jafari and I'm connecting with you today from 
um, Charlottesville, uh, the land, the traditional land of the Monacan Nation located in the James River watershed where uh, the first ship uh, of, from Africa uh, carrying enslaved people landed here in, 19, uh, in 1619 and also surrounded by two monuments of <clears throat> um, monuments that are built by the, the slave labor, one being the University of Virginia, the other one being uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, Monticello. So that's where I'm connecting um, from. Um, I am originally Persian and also from Persian and Azari descent, and I moved to Canada and the United States back in 2007 as a result of a series of geopolitical conflicts and intersectional violence that women has been experiencing at the time. And um, this, this placement or kind of going across the ocean and this process of also racialization within um, within this society has greatly informed what I do and how I do them. So um, a lot of my projects um, are divided perhaps between the two geographies of the Middle East, as well as uh, the context of the Americas. It's concerned with anti-colonial discussions both in the Middle East and also in the Americas. Um, and uh, that's where the kind of the idea of joining uh, a number of dear friends to form a nonprofit organization and, and writing uh, right off the bat a declaration on no design and stolen land, which um, comes from, which is very much uh, concerned with understanding the, um, how design and spatial practices ha have been complicit in maintaining colonial structures of power within uh, the United States and uh, Canada. So um, when a lot of work that I do has to do with uh, counter maps, but um, counter maps uh, contain more than uh, counter cartographies that, uh, that we just talked about. Uh, for me, they're also concerned with uh, creating counter narratives as some, and some form of uh, archival activism that enables us to see those historiographies that are often erased or overlooked. Um, as, as part of the, the, the colonial project in and of itself. So um, I'm going to share some uh, slides with you that um, from uh, the current initiative that I'm working on, it's, it's very much a work in the making. Um, it's called Mian Rudan or Between Rivers. And um, the, one of the main questions that I'm asking here is whether counter mapping systems of disposition and creating uh, these counter narratives by way of archival activism inform the existing shared struggles against various forms of oppression um, and uh, what role does this, this documentation can play in enabling cultural resurgence uh, that is transgenerational. Um, the project starts with observing some of the everyday news, basically the environmental injustices that we see in events, major events such as floods and, um, for instance, in the case of the right image, uh, the sandstorm, both, both of these images uh, show places within the Khuzestan region, which is at the confluence of Karun and Karka River coming from the Iranian side and the, new, the Tigris and Euphrates coming from the Iraqi side, right, uh, located at the border of in Iran and Iraq. And it raises some questions with regards to how is this happening? What is uh, the root cause of these many um, kind of environmental problems, which inherently cannot be dissociated with some of the political issues that, that the, the region has been uh, facing. So. Um, I started looking at the construction of the rivers back in history, and I'm going to talk about primarily methodological notes in this project by showing some of the images and some of the archival material. There's, there's not enough time to get into the nitty gritty of the content. Um, so I started somewhere in the middle, uh, post-1949 and the start of the American modernization project in the Middle East, which has been associated with 
uh, the President Truman's uh, point four program very much invested in um, te technical and technological assistance. Um, based primarily on, on a number of models, but one of them being um, the uh, construction of large uh, hydroelectric dams and uh, river basin developments, where, where TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, which um, has been uh, such a kind of grand project during the 1920s and 1930s in the United States, all of a sudden emerges as a model, not just in the Middle East, but across the world. And of course, building a hydroelectric dam focusing on the Khuzestan region and uh, the Karun River has been the first and probably the largest uh, project of this kind in the Middle East. Um, the, this particular image shows uh, an important figure here, David E. Lilienthal, who was um, a, a bureaucrat, American bureaucrat, one of, one of the former directors of uh, TVA, which then, because of this particular project, uh, initiates uh, the development and resource corporation based in New York. And basically the master plan has been designed for the region by this particular corporation and under his supervision. And the right image, you see him with uh, the Mohammad Reza Shah, the Shah of Iran um, in late um, 1950s in Khuzestan region where he's essentially pitching the familiarity or, or similarities between uh, Khuzestan region and Texas and the American West, to which uh, I'll come back. So um, looking more closely at these uh, techniques and technologies, not only as these technologies, but also as ideologies and monuments of power, then I started dissecting some of these ideologies and reading closely into their declaration, the, their letters, to be able to understand what they're talking about. So basically, in one of these letters, just to show you an example, Lilienthal is doing multiple things at the same time. One, he is essentially rend rendering the Khuzestan landscape as, um, as a uh, wasteland. Um, so basically completely erasing, um, it make, it making an ahistorical argument to associate the, the poverty and famine in the region with the lack of technology which he had in hand. Uh, and then the second thing he does is basically he refers back to kind of this uh, historical divide between the wasteland that is creating and imaging on one hand and the glorious kind of past empires of Persia uh, with references to some of the um, kind of British colonialists um, that has ha had a major role in represent oriental representation of the Middle East. Uh, in late 19th centuries. Um, so multiple things are happening here. I keep it very short. One, the landscape itself is completely overlooked and misunderstood. So this very complex systems of wetlands, of marshlands, seasonal lakes, uh, mud flats, et cetera, that has been essentially the context and the landscape, very much cultural landscape that have existed for many centuries are completely overlooked. And instead they're, they're shifting their attention to the so-called wasted waters. They're wasted because they're not um, uh, kind of tamed towards industrial production that the, the American uh, capitalism and the American colonialism understands as the sign of civilization. And then by looking at the landscape in and of itself, you realize that what a hoax that has been. And um, basically you understand the, these systems of water, whether it is like um, rivers, uh, glaciers, uh, uh, underground waters and shorelines that you see these regional schemes that are already existing within the region, very much based on understanding of water and what sustainability means in the region. Um, here, for instance, you see some images of marsh Arabs on the other side of the border in southern Iraq. And uh, from there, this ideology of plantation and the plantation logic uh, um, becomes really curious to be able to understand where is this kind of um, investment in turning the desert into kind of the, des the desert bloom. Where, where does that idea come from? And that's where uh, 
it, the, the story took me much deeper into the Judeo-Christian Christian, uh, perception of the Middle Eastern landscape and essentially kind of depicting the landscape between two complete opposites, one being paradise or persis or the, the word paradise, which refers to um, pardis, that in Farsi means Persian gardens. So we have Persian gardens on one side, paradise, and the other hand, the idea of the desert as wilderness, as this barren space, empty space. So by delineating all of these ideologies that comes from Judeo-Christianity and then is projected to the American West where the idea of frontier takes form, where uh, indigenous peoples are then uh, kind of erased completely from the American map, uh, being rendered as part of the wilderness, the idea of terra nullius and manifest destiny comes from. All of a sudden you see that there's been a representation based on those ideologies where these technologies of dance have been built in the first place. And these representations continue through different forms of publications until this day. Um, then you, you understand, uh, I move to have a better understanding of cu cultural um, Tran transportations back to the Middle East. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at the 1949 travel of the Shah of Iran to um, uh, to uh, the Grand Canyons as part of his trip to the American West to be able to kind of see the Hoover Dam on Colorado River. And then like some of these images, these representations really show the hypocrisy and the lie that, that is at the base of um, the pretenses of this peaceful life between these dams and technologies, new modernity on one hand, and then cultural preservation of indigenous uh, peoples on the other hand, which is completely um, false. Um, at the same time, other forms of representation has been happening within the context of Khuzestan and the Kardon River watershed, which, ha which had a lot to do with uh, concessions and opening uh, different forms of connectivity through the land, uh, as well as kind of mapping these landscapes um, in, a, in a way, kind of cartographic penetration to the region. Uh, which goes also hand in hand with the necessity of the British uh, colonial empires during the 19th and early 20th century to somehow make the geography legible through map making, but also through state building and drawing border lines. This uh, map shows the first uh, kind of survey uh, survey of the Iran Iraq or Ottoman Persian Empire borderline in 1913, which took practically 70 years and in position uh, from the Russian and British side to uh, happen. And then um, shifting attention to the histories of uh, documentary and photography, then you can see that then people in this particular case, the uh, Bakhtiri tribe who traveled uh, seasonally across the Zagros mountain and, and, and all of these kind of operations have been happening within their own tribal land are, are then um, antiquated through different modes of ethnography and ethnographic representations um, or through the work of archeologists, which uh, started during the 1930s and at the same time uh, when you see different kind of orientalist programs start to emerge uh, in different parts of the world and um, urbanization and, and kind of representing urbanization as part of this modernity has been really crucial uh, in kind of preparing the ground for the construction and, and infrastructure bu building that came um, uh, after, and in this case, we see the National Geographic uh, uh, Journal 1921, where it's kind of creating a contrast, and it's very obvious in the text as well, between the city centers that are kind of looking up, looking at the Europe, and they're kind of gravitating towards modernity on one hand, and the landscape, which is good for nothing but um, tourism. So it's, it's romanticizing the landscape and kind of glorifying the cities at the same time, which is a, then a ground for the arrival, to, for the establishment of credential systems 
um, design disciplines, um, kind of consultancy firms in the 1950s, 60s, and in the 1970s arrival of this uh, army of um, American designers uh, to um, Iran. And in this case, you can see, for instance, just to mention one uh, project, this is Ian McCart's um, Pardison Environmental Park Master Plan in Outskirts of Tehran, where he proposes to kind of look at this park as a laboratory and designating different bioregions and bring all of them in this master plan. One, for instance, being um, different species from uh, Australia. And you can see by the renderings that it's uh, very much racialized. I'm gonna stop right here because it's a transition to another chapter, which then speaks about the um, women's resistance and how this counter -cart cartography can bring in the role of women that are completely erased out of this history. What, what forms of resistance can we, uh, can we map here? And what is, what is mapping in their own world and through their own language? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to turn to Timor, who has the lovely task of um, uh, posing some questions of these three uh, very diverse presentations. I just want to remind everybody in the audience, um, we're going to come up to Q&A, but anything that you're thinking about, feel free to use the chat on the bottom to voice that and also put it on the table. So Timor. Um, thank you. I mean, first and foremost, like, uh, and Gazal, like it's such a remarkable series of work. Um, I mean, it's so inspiring and kind of like thought provoking to see the work that you put together. So just wanted to thank you for, you know, joining us today and sharing some of this work. I could easily just keep asking you questions individually for probably the next three hours. Uh, but I just all confine it to two questions really. And I know we were emailing a little before and these are actually new questions. Um, and so the questions, and I'll explain them a little bit, but the first question has to do with translation. Um, and then the second question has to do with time and layers. And so when it comes to translation, one of the things that I see between all of these projects is many kinds of translation that are at work. So there's translation between ontologies, between ways, different ways of seeing the world or understanding what a world is in the first place. There is translation between the digital and the analog. There is translation between languages. Uh, there is translation between places, if we think about it just in the geometric sense. Uh, and there's also translation between times. But all of your work in some form or fashion is also calling our attention to sort of, translation is not a seamless project. It's not a thing that just kind of happens. Um, and in, in various ways, all of your projects are deeply invested in translation and yet sort of call attention to sort of the seams, the ghosts, the obstacles, the glitches, the things that can't be translated. So one thing I'd be really curious to hear each of you kind of respond to in a moment is just where does, does translation emerge as a sort of an, an explicit concern of what you're thinking about or is it something that's always been in the background? Um, and I should say also, I wanted to flag really quickly that this comes in part, um, uh, Evren Savjus, um, who is an anthropologist at Yale, her recent book, Queer in Translation, is a really remarkable book that uh, can, has really transformed how I think about translation. And if you have not come across it, would really recommend it. The other has to do with the role of time in your projects. And so the second question that I'd love to hear each of you talk a little bit about has to do with um, how we represent time. So I mean, managed to kind of to think about where you were, like your project is very much about the layering of time and using kind of the, the possibility of OpenStreetMap to layer different kinds of times. And I mean, what was so interesting about the counter mapping project in Port Said is the ways that time is not easily representable. And so I was kind of curious to think about there. And Gazal, when time is very much about what you do, but your work, I mean, what makes it so interesting is that you're putting ostensibly very different worlds into relation. And so like by focusing on kind of the project of damming, you're able to bring ostensibly separate worlds into temporal and spatial conjunction in a way that we might not first expect. Um, and I, I see the question, I will put the, um, I'll put that uh, Evren Sajj's book in the, oh great, Jared actually just put that in. So, I mean, again, there's lots to talk about, but I wanna kind of save space also for our audience to, to respond to as well. So if you have a moment, maybe we can go Mej, uh, Mej Nermin and Gazal, 
just quickly, translation and time. I would love to hear you kind of each of you talk a little bit about those, um, how that figures in your work. Shall I start? Uh, cool. Yeah, like specifically translation, I think it's uh, uh, just uh, like just a very personal perspective, just being someone who has lived between cultures, who's played the role of translator in many, many different ways. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's uh, like it's it's almost by definition what what we do uh, uh, as in between people uh, and uh, and I think like and the act of doing counter mapping is actually a, a process of making these translations that are often taken for granted or implicitly uh, making them more visible uh, to a lot of uh, to people who don't see don't perceive them easily. Uh, I was talking actually to Nermeen just like a couple of days ago while we were preparing for, uh, we we're thinking about what to talk about in this presentation or in this talk. And, uh, and what came to my mind, uh, and I posted the link in the chat, is, the, uh, is this idealized loop of learning. Um, so the other hat that I wear is, uh, is as an urban planner. So I, I, uh, I, I work in urban planning and I study financialization of housing. And one of the things that I study is like, how can we use computer simulations to kind of create virtual worlds in which we can learn about complex systems. And what th those, the, the role of those virtual worlds is to help us kind of shift in time, uh, uh, kind of like, so as, uh, as like the I, like what most people learn like think about how we learn is that we have the real world where you perceive it and you learn something from it and then you have certain decisions that are based on this perception uh, and this uh, this uh, model that's proposed by Sturman uh, JD Sturman he's he proposes that actually like we have these like this is actually a formulation of structuration theory we have mental models and we have strategies and decisions that affect how we understand the world and he proposes that if we want to create inf interventions, if we want to change the world, we have to, we can create interventions, but it'll take a very long time, years, decades, for us to be able to perceive the feedback of information from that. So we kind of do that, this temporal shortcut by creating a virtual world, and that's what the map does, and that's what counter cartography does. The counter cartographic sphere is a, a, is, is a virtual world where we can entertain these ideas and kind of uh, explore a landscape of ideas in a in, in a temporarily compressed way. Um, so, uh, I don't know what do Nermin and Razal uh, think about this. <laughs> this is a very hard question, Timur. <laughs> but uh, when you were speaking, and also when Majid was speaking, I was thinking a lot. At least that's what the type of material I encountered during my masters was that the map came as an invention, like with the printing press to Egypt in 1798 as wow, right? Uh, this is a new invention. We had a very literary form of discussing and speaking of space and also for, um, for legislation. So like ownership and all of that was done in a particular form. And all of a sudden we have a new logic, a new way in which the state or the colonial state is, is thinking of creating visuals and um, and this I think translation of, a, of imagining that they were depicting an objective reality of the world that is measured and accountable and and, and, and um, a way you know of, of of back then I thought a lot about it with for example um, the cascade of inscriptions that uh, Bruno Latour have discussed that you have this way of map making and 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 uh, knowledge production that I say assumes to be an immutable mobile a mo something that is printed on a paper but also written and inscribed in a logic that people can add up to so all maps have um, a grid uh, all maps have a very fixated median point uh, a particular scale and accordingly map over map over map and here you have the truth or how the state or the empire is being managed. On the other hand side, you had worlds and communities and lives that was managed in a totally different way, in, in, in a totally, um, and the medium in which this world was inscribed, which is the literary description of al-Khitab, offered 
totally different sides. Um, I'm no historian, so I cannot speak of that, but I think a lot of good historians at least would speak about how the way these um, uh, Khutat was written affected how ownership was contested, for example, or debated uh, juridistically. Um, as uh, when I take this hat off and become uh, try to pretend to be a, a map maker, uh, I think translation becomes even an much more harder. So when I worked, at least the work I did with Alia, these were all narratives that were counter narratives in many ways. They were narratives that resisted the official um, history of how Persaid, for example, fought its three wars, or how uh, Alexandria had a life that is uh, more uh, before the rise of a nationalist, all Egyptian um, uh, form of, of image and also one that contests and contradicts the uh, cosmopolitan imaginary of the city. And our role was to try to translate, but we were always, or, or to try to translate the archival material that we found in a way that would be more interactive or legible for people to, to play and speak with. And I'm not sure if we succeeded or we have failed because we have succeeded in showing how complex and hard to, to read it is, but still it was not easy to read. And that's what we wanted at the very beginning. And I think this is the problem that all people who have to perform this role of translation, either from one language to the other or from one medium to the other, uh, inevitably face. And, and I think here comes the inevitable way that we need to select and we need to be very uh, reflective on what we decide to keep and what on the map and what we decide to to show uh, and i think here we can ascribe the title of a counter map it is to me one that challenges or at least dissects power structures or brings vis visible or more visibility to a counter narrative so i don't know if i answered also the question i hope i at least i tried <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tamar, for um, these solid questions. So uh, with regards to translation, I want to refer to three points here, one being general and two more situated within the project that I just discussed. So the first one, um, for me, translation has been always um, serving the purpose of creating solidarity. Right, solidarity between two different worlds. And um, because there is a lot to share, even though, for instance, like histories are not mutual, some of the experiences are not mutual. But um, when I'm working in the context of the Americas, then all of a sudden you see that, um, with regards to, for instance, the, the histories of colonialism, histories of violence, histories of disposition, of erasure of women, etc., there is a lot to talk about. And um, these storytellings and sharing the stories in a way, for me, is a bridge that works towards solidarity, to, to support solidarity as um, an intellectual, actively intellectual process of learning. Um, so that's, that's the first one. Um, the, the second uh, point is that, for instance, when we're talking about rivers, the health of rivers that are essentially foundations of life, um, they're not, uh, it's not oil, it's not GDP, it's the health of the rivers. And in the context that I'm studying, all of a sudden you see that these watersheds are, are essentially homelands to many different ethnic cities, many different ethnic groups and languages, for instance, Lor, Bakhtiari, Arab, Persian, um, among others, therefore, and, and the context is very, um, uh, has always been uh, the, 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 the kind of the place of geopolitical conflicts and between these different ethnicities and different languages as well. So it's not always um, the kind of external imperial power, but that those external powers very much rely on the existing conflicts that are very much um, historical. Right, and, and has a lot to do with kind of biases, competitions, etc. So, uh, being able to find a mutual language or constantly going from one language to the other to be able to explain uh, what is at risk between, um, between 
different communities is something that is really, really important. And this type of discussions, this type of projects are completely outside the limits of national na nation states and national borders and nationalistic conversations, right? Because they, they're essentially referring to much larger um, uh, stories at play, the, namely the new liberal um, global market that uh, intends to kind of eliminate any barrier to trade. Um, the, and the third one, I wish to share, um, I'd like to share one image with you. This one. Um, so this image is showing uh, a kind of carpet that is called Vagire. It's by, um, it's Lorboff, it's by Lor people. And basically it, it has a very weird shape, it goes back to mid 18th century. And you can see that uh, this is a very unique kind of carpet. It is, um, it, it's kind of template. It, it's something that um, was, uh, given from one gen generation to the other as a template for them to remember what are those patterns that belongs to their family because these patterns and these languages um, of weaving are in fact the birthright of tribal women and rural women and, and women who live in rural areas and do this kind of work. So um, there is, uh, I'd say, an important project here. Um, which has to do with documentation. In Farsi, we call it tadvin. Um, and with many precedents that we are inheriting from our history in music, in painting, it's very clear that it, when it comes to tadvin or documenting this time-tested um, territorial practices, uh, landscape practices, or this type of cultural practices, which in fact can be read as a map of the territory in and of itself, is so essential for carrying these tra transgenerational forms of resistance forward and enable perhaps cultural and political resurgence in the, in the future generations. That I see as a form of translation. Like there's one uh, one thought kind of to, to continue along the same line as as um, uh, I think uh, there's uh, like one of the the axioms that we use in uh, in systems design is that uh, uh, like uh, the map is a model, right? It's a model of how the world works. Uh, it's and the uh, and the but in in systems design, we we say that all models are, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, uh, and it's useful for a specific purpose. Like a map is a purposeful representation of the world that has a specific a specific purpose, and where and that's where the the question of translation. Um, uh, and who is the user of the map is uh, is really interesting because uh, like we don't create maps or counter maps for that matter for uh, just uh, randomly just uh, like abatian what's the word uh, just uh, 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 we we create them for specific purposes and that's uh, and that's what I think Vazal is kind of pointing to and what and their main out as well. Yes, Vazal is. Uh, as Gazelle was uh, talking, I was thinking the etymology of river in English is connected also to rival. And there's a way to think about what rivers do is that they both connect, but they also divide. So if you think about, and this is particularly interesting when we talk about, I grew up in California. And so like the history of water law in California is this really interesting thing. Um, and I think actually that speaks really nicely to what translation does as well. Because translation, I mean, is, in Gazal's wonderful phrasing, is about creating solidarity. It's creating solidarity without assuming community in a, a sort of common thing. And it calls attention to that work. Um, but translation and the fact that we're required to translate is always calling attention to the possibility that it might fail, that there is some kind of difference operating there. 
So I think translation becomes, a re again, for one of the reasons why it was such an interesting theme running through all of your projects. Um, just to echo something that Jared put in the chat, we are, I think, entering the part of the, um, uh, the conversation today where if people have questions that they'd love to put to our panelists, um, I know Jared is keeping an eye on things. You can um, message him directly and he'll relay it to the group, um, or you can put it um, uh, your chat in the um, your question in the chat and we'll be able to follow along. Um, in the in the meantime, maybe as people are kind of gathering their thoughts, one last question kind of to, to close my my discussiveness is coming back to this idea of creating solidarity and also its struggles. Um, so maybe, again, I know that both of all of these projects come out of huge contexts. I mean, we're, we're talking about really struggles of dispossession, histories of dispossession that are, I mean, far beyond what we're able to kind of address here. Um, maybe if you could just talk really briefly about one success, like, is there a way that you've seen your work? Um, Cause we often talk about our failures, but I think it's, it's, would be really curious. Has there been one moment where you found these maps and this, these projects of counter mapping, something that help the people you're engaging with build some kind of solidarity um, that you didn't necessarily expect to find? Maybe start with Nermeen and um, Nermeen Ghazal and then Amaj. Mm, um, I think I have one moment. Uh, so, uh, so when we made this map uh, in Port Said, there were a lot of people uh, who contributed their own like family photographs of people who were part of civil resistance, for example. But also when we went to the city, there was a group of uh, very uh, young um, um, high school and university students who uh, started an initiative called Por Saida Al Adimu, which was basically they were trying to document the old uh, buildings of Por Said before they're being bought by real estate developers and demolished. And what I've known after that we left is that they continued contributing to the map for like four months until the whole space was closed, the whole uh, art center. I mean, what has happened after that in Egypt um, was closed. Um, but I, I don't think of that as, I think of that as a, a continuation or at least an attempt. I also learned later that they have continued to experiment with maps and mapping uh, in, in a similar way and to develop their own uh, methods. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I can call this a success, but it made me very uh, appreciative of the moment and of what it meant to be in contact with someone else. And also, of course, teaching always does that. And I was very appreciative to the thoughts and to learning from how once we start, at least because maybe I taught in a school of architecture where maps are rarely scrutinized. so architecture uh, departments, or at least the ones I've encountered in Egypt are all about production, are all about product producing a perfect image, a perfect render, uh, something that would sell. But um, to start um, a course, um, even if it's um, a, a small workshop or, a, or an activity that starts to scrutinize that, I think the biggest um, um, outcome is that you live in perhaps uh, a young architect's mind, how heavy is a line that they plot on a paper or how big it is to, to think of that. That to me, I think uh, is, um, is, is um, I, I don't dare to say it's success, but I would feel that this is a successful moment. If people really understand, especially those who are uh, trained to become urban planners and architects, the impact of their work and the impact of the images and drawings that they produce. I think that actually probably leads perfectly into Ghazal's um, kind of conversation. So maybe if we can turn to Ghazal real quickly. Sure, it's really difficult to say <laughs> where I've seen the impact, <laughs> especially with regards to this project, because it's very much at the very beginning um, of the road. But 
Um, there are a couple of things that I want to mention, um, also emphasizing on what Narmin was mentioning, kind of the normalization of particular types of representation. So for me, I think the first step of impact would be denormalizing uh, these systems of representation, first and foremost. Um, but then, I forgot what I, what I wanted to say. Um, with regards to archival activism, um, a lot of the work that I'm, I'm currently involved in has to do with digitization of the um, of the kind of physical material, right? And um, that, in and of itself, I think um, it should be something that we should um, care about uh, and uh, take on as an important task, especially um, because now I think we're. Um, at a level of maturity to be able to understand that even though um, these digital platforms are shared, they're, they're, they're very much, they very much rely on physical infrastructures that those can be controlled, right? So like if we refer to, for instance, what was happening back in 2019, November 2019 in Iran, what happened was that um, essentially the, the government shut down the internet for one week to kind of, uh, uh, impede the distribution of the images of violence that was occurring around um, the country. Or, for instance, if you consider the fact that there is this national resource of information, historical data that is um, kind of guarded very, very closely by, for instance, the state institutions, um, then all of a sudden this kind of making of the archive in and of itself and the role it can play in um, in transparency of knowledge um, becomes really important, whether it, it's with regards to the historical knowledge or it's with regards to the everyday news. As maybe, if, yeah, if we can turn to you. Uh, so one of the slides that I did skip uh, is about, maybe it's, it fits perfectly as, as an answer to, uh, to the question that you posed. I'm going to share it again. Um, so this slide, uh, so as I said, I, I run these mapathons and I, I kind of continue what Ghazal was saying, but the digitization of this material, of this physical artifact is really important. But I also think there is another layer, which is actually extracting the data out of those physical artifacts. And that's what I do with the mapathons. And the mapathons are basically, I invite 20, 30, 10, it could be 10, it could be even 40 people. Uh, and they help me using the open source collaborative infrastructure of OpenStreetMap to extract the data out of the maps. With the full knowledge that these are colonial maps that were not made for us as Palestinians to remember who we are, but were made for a British colonial authority to occupy the land. So, but in the mapathons, we do two things. Uh, like we, we, I invite, I get a lot of different people attending. So I want to kind of highlight the two, my two favorite mapathons. The one to the left is in the Dawi refugee camp in the north of Lebanon, and uh, the attendees were the youngest cohort that I've had at, as attendees or participants or mappers, set of mappers, let's say, and uh, they were mostly Palestinian Syrians who ended up in as Palestinian Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Uh, and if for anyone who has grown up in a, in a Palestinian uh, refugee camp, you know that like every street is named after an ethnically cleansed village. Every school is named after an ethnically cleansed village. Every, uh, like ev everything is named after one of those villages. Um, uh, and as a 14 year old teenager who has been hearing about these places, their entire lives, but never seen them in, in physically uh, in front of them. Like you can see like the, this guy here, how happy he looks. He's like the first time that you actually see your village. Uh, and even if it's, a, if it's a map, even if there is no phys, like there is no ground level image of what the map, of what the village looked like, at least you see what, it's, what the spatial layout was. And uh, and not only that, you're also contributing to a data set that then maybe when they grow up and they go to university, they'll be using to kind of create a form of, uh, of kind of like to do their own research about, what's, uh, about what the land looked like and what the transformations that it's gone uh, through and so on. 
the re other like really like one of the dearest moments of my to my heart in this process is this other mapathon which I held in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, so my when my family in 2003, my family immigrated to Canada. Uh, uh, to Kitchener. And in this photo, there are my, three, three of my favorite people. There's my little sister here at the front, and uh, she was my technical helper. And uh, she was going around and helping all of the, all of the, the, the mappers in like technical problems that they were having with the software. And then there's my mom, who is uh, who's kind of like the coordinator of the event. Uh, and there's my grandmother here. And she was uh, and you'd ask like, what is your grandma doing here at the Mapathon? She doesn't know how to read the map, uh, but what she knows is actually how to uh, how to reverse the transliteration in the in the in the place names. So all of the place names are are written in uh, uh, in transliterated Arabic, transliterated into Latin English letters. So. Uh, and to uh, the ear of someone who doesn't know the place names, it's very difficult to distinguish between, for example, sa and se, do and de. Uh, uh, and, but for my grandma, it was trivially easy. Like I would start spelling out the place name and she would immediately know that how to reverse the transliteration. So this is, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of success. It's a, it's, we joined three generations of people who were all contributing to the, to the creation of this massive data set about Palestine as it was in the 30s and 40s. And I keep getting asked, like, why don't you just use machine translation? It'll be so much faster. You don't have to run all of these mapathons. I'm like, no, I, I, I want it to be slow. I want it to be purposeful and I want it to be deliberate. And I want these encounters with the mappers to happen. So that's, I think, a success, uh, a glimpse of success in the, in the torturous history of Palestine. So we have a, uh, a question actually from one of my students here. Uh, thanks, Noah, who I think actually speaks to something that I've been curious about as well and kind of engaging with your work, which is what foundational work did have each of you tried to build upon? And then how do you how does your work how do you work to create a legacy so that the impactful work that you do continues to re re rewrite narratives? And so I can imagine each of you is drawing on kind of a rich, you know, a huge amount of work and kind of inspiration. So is there one place, where would you start? What is one thing that you've kind of read or encountered that you've kind of has been transformative for you in developing this work? Maybe start with Gazal. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to answer that question because it comes from many different places, but um, I, I take, inspiration from um, work of women who've been trying um, to um, map themselves in the narratives that they tell and um, and also map other women's that have been erased because I have a feeling that at the core of the all the violences that we're studying um, is not just the gender violence but it's particularly um, kind of violence against women and um, so if I want to mention one person among many, 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 um, that would be Shirin Anishad, who's a Persian uh, photographer and filmmaker. And she's been kind of trying to create that a borderland space um, as, a, as an immigrant artist for herself, kind of being, staying uh, in the borderland between two different cultures and two different words and uh, kind of maintain that ambiguous place and understand what it means. Thank you. Majda then Nermeen. I would say uh, like two people uh, when specifically when it comes to maps of Palestine, I absolutely like Salman Abu Sitta, even, I, even though I like I have certain problems with his approach, but I like he's absolutely been like an inspiration for us and uh, his work is uh, like he's in his, his 80s and his work has been like like tireless over decades but also I think uh, and Nermin is like how the, in the context in which I met Nermin like Nermin and I got to know each other and we started our collaboration through the work of Ali Amsalam and I think this is like it was such an impactful uh, 
a set of workshops for me. Like it's it made me meet Nermin, it made me meet Alia, it made me um, uh, like understand that archival work uh, and uh, actually archives uh, and history and maps and uh, are not just uh, historical documents. They're living with us and they affect our everyday life right now. Um, uh, so I think uh, if, if you haven't seen the work of Aliya Musallam, you're missing out and you should definitely uh, uh, like see it. I'll drop a link in the chat. That'd be great, thank you. And Nermeen. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Majd. <laughs> that was, uh, means a lot, but oh, yes, the work of Alia and all our preparations and everyone who attended all the workshops also, how people brought their own experiences of space and of their um, uh, perceptions of visualizing space uh, and routes and paths that they wanted to, to make a uh, scene. We also looked together, me and Alia, it was Alia's recommendation about, uh, for some um, 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 mapping projects that happened in South Africa. And I will post a link for a book called, this is not an atlas, it's a collection of um, counter or critical maps. Um, and it is happening everywhere. I think all of all initiatives that aim to decipher a particular historical narrative or to contradict a hegemonic narrative do uh, at the very end in in forms of storytelling or in terms of co-working they they use a pen and a paper uh, in at a moment or they use a way of drawing a line that connects point a and point b and that in itself is a map it does not have to have like a cartographic base or um a, a spatial uh, only only a spatial uh, form um so there's a lot of of works that's happening every day and yeah Great, thank you, um, and, th and thank you much. Thank you for putting the um, chats in here as well, or the links, or the names and um, links in the chat. Um, Jared, I see you pinning yourself here. I, I I popped up. So you know we do there. We still have lots of people here in the audience. Again, that the, the table is is open. We're coming up to two, so we're going to end um, shortly. But I want to maybe pose a difficult, open-ended question here. Um, as kind of a main instigator here in coming up with the digital foray series, which is trying to, um, you know, think about this quickly changing digital quagmire that we're all in. Um, in each of the sessions, one thing that I'm always thinking about is, okay, how do these participants from such different backgrounds and disciplines also see where are things going in the next five, 10 years, right? You know, the kind of like immediate future in terms of, you know, what does this mean for your teaching? What does this mean for PhD candidates? A lot of what you guys are bringing up are also so much about solidarity, but also this idea of collaboration. Um, and so I realize this is a very vague question, but also just looking forward, if there's any ideas of uh, where you think things are going or where they or where you think they they I think there's many threads of where you guys are kind of identifying where they should go um, but yeah just looking forward in terms of uh, not just mapping but really the nuance and the depth of what all three of you brought in of these counter um, of this pushback um, into the kind of more normative views that we have And they thought my question was difficult, Jared. <laughs> well, no, but this is, but the, again, I, I, I ask this in the spirit of like, um, you know, the digital for is like sometimes what the, the beauty of bringing together such different people is there's no clear direction of where it's going, but we're trying to kind of make sense of all of these changes. And so it's a very contingent provisional or even hopeful answer that I guess fishing for. If I, I can, I can just, I think I have an answer, an answer. Uh, 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 so there's a lot of people talking about mapping, like, it, like the spatial turn has, like, is fully in effect, right? And uh, 
and it's not just uh, like in academia, it's it, like it's all over the world. And the, if you look at the size of companies uh, like uh, Silicon Valley companies that are concerned with spatial analysis and spatial map uh, data, uh, they're growing massively, like, uh, and they're becoming worth billions and billions of dollars. And there's satellites that are going up there capturing data that are so detailed about the world that we live in. And so we have this move towards like more precise, more accurate, more uh, temporally, uh, uh, like a higher temporal resolution data. And all of that is, it's, 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 it's one uh, epistemic framework and one ontology forcing itself onto everything that we have to do with data. And, uh, and this is kind of represented in, uh, uh, <laughs> Like this is a bit nerding out on uh, open street map uh, community stuff. Uh, there's this, uh, there, there's a group, there's this tension in the open street map community between people who want to do like mass data imports from government institutions and so on. There's, and there's this like group of people who call themselves the, uh, the craft mappers. And they want to kind of hand create maps. Uh, and I think this tension is only gonna grow over the next uh, five to 10 years uh, where like capital is gonna invade the spatial sphere uh, and the, spa the spatial data sphere. And I think there's uh, with machine learning, like trying to understand the world through machine learning uh, and perpetuating all of the biases of that, uh, uh, but also like we like what we've seen, for example, with Dr. Timnit Gubru, uh, the, the machine learning uh, researcher who was fired from Google, uh, 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 from Google Google AI ethics team. Uh, she's like she's been doing she's been doing the critical work on how how do you do this uh, like AI analysis, machine learning analysis. Uh, on these massive data sets in an ethical way, and I think we're we're failing miserably at that. And uh, and then we and then Google fires her, you know. <laughs> so, so we have this uh, like this tension that I think it's it's going to keep growing over the next uh, five to ten years. And I I'm scared of what's going to happen next. But I like I don't know. I'll follow I'll follow Gramsci and think of the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. And I'll say you know. Will will eventually the counter cartographers will win eventually. <laughs> Anybody else? No, no pressure to, to take that question. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, what I see um, is a really exciting shift. I think. Um, the younger generation is really, really conscious and completely aware of the uh, power dynamics, whether we're talking about um, the, the, the United States or whether we're talking about the uh, context of Iran. Um, I think they're really aware of power dynamics and uh, I see a lot of um, demand for change, a lot of uh, demand for um, disobedience, even within the academia, disobedience from um, the mainstream canon of architecture and design um, that, um, uh, that is really exciting and really appealing because uh, these kids, um, well, I should not call them kids become, because I'm also a millennial, um, but basically this younger generation um, is, has both the tools and the skills and also the need and the consciousness for something that is completely different. So um, I think they're good, these kids are all right. <laughs> I love the optimism there, yeah. Nermeen, do you have, do you have any, any, any thought on that? I don't know, to be honest. Um, how, where could these projects take us? I have uh, stopped working on this project. <laughs> Uh, but only to start a PhD on a totally other topic. But to me, at least what I tried to do in these projects, I was not trying to produce a map that is alternative for the state period, as Majd was saying. Um, it was basically a way of visualizing a thinking process and trying to have a tangible trace that we can follow to tell a story of a place. So to me, it has already done, 
do it, its uh, its end. It, it it did what I needed it to do at that moment, which is to understand better, to understand the relationship, a complex relationship between time and space, to be able to uh, put multiple voices over one map, multiple contradicting voices, and to see where they intersect and how they intersect. So I did not, um, but that was also a very a particular experience of me because I did not think of that as a big project from the very beginning. It has just evolved with uh, with time and, and chances. Um, but I think that one way of um, um, it living on its own, for example, is through how, um, at least as, as I left them, the schools of architecture are now starting to change and are now starting to have more spaces for interdisciplinary research, for reflecting at least a bit about uh, urban, urban planning programs. And that's what I hope that happens by time. Uh, but I, I totally agree with Mej that uh, if we zoom out from these particular projects and see what is happening in terms of visualizing data and maps production, it is very scary. Um, yeah. The precipice of peril and promise, which we continue to traverse. Um, maybe just in closing, and you know, I, so the course I'm teaching at, at NYU right now, um, digital methodologies in in Middle Eastern studies, and you know, we kind of were mapping over the digital forays. And today, one of the readings was uh, Richard White from Stanford of what is spatial history, right? And I just loaded it up here because uh, for class you know, he gets to the end and he was like, yeah, but it's not about this and it's not about this. It's actually like, this is about a different way of doing research, right? A different way of informing and realizing things. And so maybe just kind of in closing the, what, what I think all of you are also kind of pushing for is just a different method, right? And Maj, I'm thinking of that workshop. I mean, the real gem here as the anthropologist honing in on the most anecdotal of your mom and your grandma there that really becomes so illustrative of like, no, like we don't need AI and machine learning there because the process of actually doing that is the solidarity in the community. And there is so much meaning in that. And so, um, yeah, again, here we are on, on, on all of that. So um, we're a little bit over time, everybody in the audience, we will stop the recording. Thank you everybody for, for coming.